Okay, it looks like we are live. So um, this time we're doing a Spooky Houses chat with Kevin Wood. Say hi, Hello. Kev. Hey, Gary. Thanks for having me on. Lo local peeps might recognize Kevin's voice. He's the morning show guy at WXRX, um, which actually brings me up brings up one of the questions I was going to ask you. Sure. Um, is uh, from from when I was on your show the first time, you asked me, and I'm going to send it right back at you. Were okay. you a monster kid? Yeah. Yeah, you know what? I, I grew up watching a lot of uh, uh, horror movies, like, at, at way too young of an age, like, way too young. And we're, we're talking, like, I mean, it started with, like, Jason and Freddy, you know, the, the 80s slasher movies uh, from when I was a kid. But then, you know, that, of course opened up so many other doors, so many other avenues, you know, the classics, the Frankensteins, the Draculas, and, uh, um, you know, Creepshow uh, was a big one. Creepshow, the Stephen King, George Romero movie. Um, and of course, you know, ever since then, I've been, you know, consuming as much uh, horror content as possible, for sure. So yes, to answer your question, I it's definitely was. Uh, I was drawing monsters in my notebook when I shouldn't take in math notes, stuff like that. <laughs> Well, you and I both did that. That's funny. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I was doing the exact same thing as a kid. Um, now, let's talk about this is the book. Whoop, I'm terrible at lining this stuff up on these, but this is uh, Spooky Houses. Mm -hmm. And Kevin's got a story, Mrs. Harper's Stones, in here, which also appeared in another one of my books. But um, why don't you tell people about the story without giving too much away, maybe what inspired it, what, what goes on? Sure. And it's funny because the story actually started just as a title. I don't know how it came to me, but I just thought of the phrase Mrs. Harper's Stones. I'm not even sure where it came from, but um, and that kind of got things bubbling in my head as to what what could Mrs. Harper's Stones actually be. And it got me thinking about uh, there was this uh, neighbor of ours a few blocks down in Lansing, Illinois, um, that had these kind of stone lions out in their front yard and uh they were always they always were scary looking to me and i always i always thought because they had like this wrought iron gate as well around their whole front yard and it just seemed kind of like gothic and creepy at the time and i always thought like if i went into their yard the lions would come alive and uh, and uh, come to get me so i kind of incorporated that into uh, the idea of the story which you know it was kind of like two kids who work for um, a grocery delivery uh, service, you know, their, their father owns a grocery store and they, um, uh, they kind of go to make a delivery to this creepy house that nobody wants to go to because it, it's legendary in the town for being haunted. There's, you know, legends of the past where the lady who lives inside will, you know, steal children, you know, kind of like the old, uh, you know, a witch lives here type, <laughs> type of thing. Don't go in there. The witch will, uh, will, will steal you away. And, uh, you know, um, the stones, uh, are out in front of her house and they, they're these really creepy kind of gargoyle statues um, that are really off-putting to the kids. And uh, as it turns out, you know, the stones are, are more than what they seem. They are um, there to do her bidding, so, so to speak. And they are, uh, you know, and I won't go much further than that, but um, I think what really, uh, what really ties the story together for me is that it kind of, it's kind of more about the way stories are told and changed, um, you know, in, 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 a t in a small town, especially, you know, uh, the rumor mill uh, in a small town can really twist things around. And um, also kind of about when you're a child, it's hard to get grownups to believe you, you know, <laughs> and, and what, what really happened. Uh, so they, a, 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 as vague a statement as I can make <laughs> about what it's really about. Well, and I think one thing everybody can probably relate to is I'm guessing that every single neighborhood, every community has the house that everybody thinks is haunted when you're a kid. I know sure. we had a couple of them that were right next to each other when I grew up. And it turned out, I think they were just owned by a couple of elderly guys and they'd been in their family for years. They were a couple brothers, mm -hmm. but, you know, everybody thought they were creepy and it was rumors they were haunted and, um, so I think that's something pretty much universal for people. Sure. Um, sure. You know, and, and, you know, and I think, you know, for the most part, if you ever got to go inside of that house for real, you might find out it's not as scary as you thought. And uh, the story I wanted to write was, well, what if it actually was? <laughs> right. What if it actually really was that scary inside? Yeah. 
and maybe even scarier. I don't know. I think the way the way your story goes, I think it's probably scarier than a kid could have thought up. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, a little bit. Uh, you know, I actually look back on it sometimes, and I mean, it it's not my favorite piece of work. Um, uh, it, it it kind of, it is kind of disturbing um, if you look at the way things turn out in the story. But uh, you know, it was it was actually really hard for me to write, like hard for me to word what I was trying to get across, you know, that that's something you run into as a writer all the time. Uh, but particularly oh, yeah. this one, because I really wanted to, wanted it to be a very particular way and really kind of spell out what happened without completely exactly saying it, you know, like I definitely wanted to show, not tell in this one. And uh, it was, it was actually more challenging than it might seem when you read it. Uh, I read it again recently and uh, you know, it's, with a fresh set of eyes, you know, and I think I did the job, but it was, it's really, it, to me, it still feels clunky, but that, I think that's just because it's my work and you're, you're really critical of your own work usually. Right. Yeah. I, you know, I read something the other day. It was, it was about art, but it applies obviously to writing as well. And somebody said that you're always going to look at your art and think that it's not all that good because what you're seeing is you in it and you're seeing your mm -hmm. work in it. But that's what actually makes it yours. And you, if you try to get that out of it, number one, you can't because it's who you are. Right. But number two, if you do, it ceases to be your work, you know. And I think we all sort of see our own stuff as clunkier than the average person would see it, you know. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, it's actually I, I, had, I struggle I had, with that too. I had some trouble actually placing this one uh, before I sent it to you. Um, I had been sending stuff to a guy at uh, Allegory Magazine, and uh, you know, he he said he he liked this one, but it was, he said, you know, I knew exactly what was going to happen before it even happened, and you know, like this, this, you know, he's really into twist endings and things like that, which is not what this story is. You know what I mean? It's just it's not an M Night, Sham M. Night Shyamalan story, you know, by any means. But um, you know, I actually did another run through it before I sent it to you, uh, another rewrite, and I think that really. Uh, kind of drove it home, you know? Um, but like, yeah, I could look at it right now and be like, okay, I want to change that and that and that. I don't think, I don't think any artist of any kind, whether you're like a musician or a filmmaker or, or anything will look at their work and be like, yes, that's done no matter what. I think it's always something oh, you could exactly. fix. Yeah. And you know, what's funny when you mentioned Allegory Magazine, I recently had a piece rejected from there too. <laughs> and um, he kind of rejected it because he said it was uh, more show don't tell. But the point mm -hmm. was the whole story, it was literally intended as an allegory. So I thought it was kind of funny that, you know, mm -hmm. a show don't, it should be show, or should, he said it was tell don't show. And it's yeah. supposed to be tell because it's an allegory. Yeah. That's what an allegory is. And Allegory Magazine rejected it, which I thought was really kind of rich and funny. But <laughs> so. Yeah, you know, and I, I've, I've placed work with them before, and they, uh, you know, they've been really nice to me over over the years. Um, but they're, they're um, you know, he'll tell you exactly why uh, yeah. he rejects your story, which is really good. I like that because sometimes you just get the form letter, you know, you get the form letter, not for us, thanks, you know, uh, but he'll actually oh, yeah. go through and be like, you know, I really like this, but at the end, it didn't make sense because, you know, and he'll actually... You know, and getting a personal note, no matter if it's a rejection or not, is always better than the form letter because it means they actually paid attention. Oh, yeah, exactly. Exactly. And it's like, uh, I don't know, I, I thought it was a pleasant enough rejection as rejections. Go. Yeah, sure. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, I remember hearing that Stephen King had a whole folder of them he had kept over the years. So, you know, people, everybody yeah. gets them. Yeah. You know, that story actually That's goes that he started with a nail on his wall and started nailing his rejection slips to the wall above his desk. And then by the time he published his first story, it had he had, he had changed it to a railroad spike. That's how many rejection <laughs> slips he collected. And that just goes to show how much work he put in before he actually started to see any success at all. And that, that's that's I like I love that about his story because it just means he didn't stop. Exactly. Exactly. Now, what else? You've got some other writing going, right? Or I know you're sort of you sort of <laughs> struggle and sort of get turned off on it and then back on it. Well, yeah, you know, it's just you know, like all the other things I have going on tend to uh, take precedence over it. Just the you know, with work and and other things that I get my own self into. Like I just finished the Little Shop of Horrors at Starlight Theater. 
Um, I Which was we're going to talk about in a minute or two. Okay, yeah, we'll get to that. Um, uh, and so that took up a lot of my time. And then, of course, I have the morning show job, which is, you know, you can't just fake that either. You know, so like a lot of my creative energy is going to other places. I have a folder, I think, in, in one of my hard drives called Stories, and you can find many incomplete works in those in those stories. I even have a story that I began on my phone uh, because I didn't have any other uh any other means by writing. So, I mean, I've, I've got lots of unfinished stuff and it's not even unfinished because I didn't like what I was doing. It's just that I got dragged away from it in one direction or another and I uh, couldn't get back to it. Um, Cause it, you know, it's not something, <laughs> I mean, you really have to have time, you know, you, you can't rush it. So you really have to have the time to write. And that's, uh, there are big chunks of the year when I do and I get to it, but it's, uh, you know, it's here and there now as, as much as I would love for it to be every day. It's not always possible. Yeah. Um, so funny you, you asked about, even... yeah, yeah, go ahead. Oh yeah. So you were saying, you know, if I had anything in the works, I do, I, 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 uh, um, I have two different ideas for a novel that are both horror novels. Okay. Um, nice. and then one that is not a horror novel and, and it's something I thought of a long time ago um, that is completely different from anything I've ever started before. And I, I have to create a whole new world to write it and a whole new set of rules for the world. And, uh, you know, it's like uh, you know, a lot of characters I get to create, a lot of uh, creatures I get to create and things like that. Kind of a, a you know, a fantasy uh you know, dystopian fantasy story about, uh, about monsters, but not a horror story, if that makes sense. Um, and, uh, like, so it's like, I get these ideas and I got to start writing it now. You know what I mean? You, you get that feeling where it's like, I got to start writing this now. And then you go and you right. go and you go and you run out of steam or you get busy or whatever, and, and you don't get back to it. But like, so I, I feel like I have a lot of neglected children sitting in a folder <laughs> that I need to get back and tend to, but yeah. Well, and that actually brings up a little bit of a question. This is something my friend Heath Alberts um, talks about, that writers basically fall into two categories. There's either planners and pantsers. In other words, mm -hmm. you either plan out the entire thing and then fill it in, or you just go by the seat of your pants once you've started it. Which Where do you fit? I'm definitely a pantser. I definitely <laughs> always have been. Uh, anytime I've ever tried to plot something out, I just felt forced. Uh, you know, I always knew where I wanted to go with it, but I never really like sat down and did an outline. Uh, and I've tried it before and I just can't do it. I'm like, this doesn't feel right to me. I like to, I like to watch the story unfold as I write it, you know, and that's just something that I've always enjoyed doing. Um, because if I already know how it's going to end, why, you know, what's my incentive to keep writing? You know, <laughs> like it's, it's almost like I'm oh, yeah. it as I go. Yeah. So yeah, I'm definitely a pantser. I think uh, more writers are pantsers than would care to admit it. Actually. It's more, I think it's just more yeah, it's fun a, that way. I think I tend to, like, I, like I've said in interviews with Heath before, I think I tend to fall into sort of a hybrid in that I know how it starts. I know how it ends. What I don't know is the journey to get there and the right. character and the events all sort of di dictate that, you know? Right. Right. Yeah. Um, you, you kind of got to let them take you where they want to go. Uh, you know, like what, what decision would that character make and how would it affect the direction of the story? You know, uh, right. and you know, it will it take you to that place you wanted to get to in the story, you know, and uh, you know, a lot of decisions have to be made along the way, but it's kind of cool to see where your own imagination goes. And I like it better. Than right. That. Exactly. So now, um, you mentioned the uh, Little Shop of Horrors. Now, that mm -hmm. was like your acting thing? Yeah, you know, I, I used to do theater in, in high school, and uh, I never really, I, mean, I never did it again after high school, but I really, I really was into it in school. Like, I, I wanted to go into it. I just, I never really went to college out of high school, so I didn't really have another outlet to do it. I'm sure there were community theaters or whatever. Um, but I, you know, just got into other things. I started, you know, playing music and being in bands and <laughs> spending a lot of time trying to be a rock star. I never really got back into uh, theater until uh, earlier this year. I heard they were going to do Little Shop of Horrors at Starlight Theater and said, this is the show I've always wanted to be a part of. It didn't matter what role. I just I wanted to be in it. You know, just let me be in it. And uh, 
you know, you have to audition. It's it's not like I can just be like, hey, can I be in this? You know, so I had right. to like put a tape. I had to put an audition tape together. They had uh, they had video auditions this year. Usually they do them in person, but you had to do a song from the show. You had to do a dance, which not a dancer <laughs> and you know they, they had a, a video a choreographer do a video where she teaches you the dance they want you to do so you know i learned the dance and i i had to memorize a scene and do a scene um and uh turned in my video and got a call saying hey we want you to come and be in the show i was in the ensemble and i was also uh, an understudy for the dentist part which if you know the movie that's the steve martin character in little shop of horrors um, the so i was yeah. I was kind of an understudy slash standby for uh, him and the dentist in the in the play at Starlight. It was played by a guy named Michael Palmandary. Uh, he's a Rockford guy. He's really funny, and uh, he did a great job. So if anybody was going to have that part besides me, I'm glad it was him. We'll put it that way. No, no bitter feelings here. I was just glad to be in the show and sing all the songs that I love. And uh, you know, I, it really got me off my ass this summer, which is <laughs> which is a big deal. It really did. Uh, you know, I would I don't know what I would have done this summer other than you know sit inside and sulk so uh, i was really glad i did that and you know what little shop of horrors is you know it's exactly uh right down the pipe for me because it's a it's like a b science fiction horror story you know uh exactly. the, the nerdy guy who uh you know suddenly finds success because of this man-eating plant that he's discovered and uh it and then in turn encourages him to keep feeding it blood and um it's a you know it's a sell your soul to the devil story. It's a it's a great moral dilemma story, which, um, you know, I don't know if I've ever been able to write a story with a really good moral dilemma, um, but those 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 usually make the best stories. I think you know if you really have a uh, a good moral dilemma, I'm thinking of like Breaking Bad, for example. I don't know if you're familiar with the the show Breaking no, I have Bad. Not. I've heard great things about it, but I've never seen it. It's really good. I mean, from a storytelling standpoint, it's really good because you have the chemistry teacher who's a family man and kind of a dope, you know, kind of just a dopey, you know, you know, fuddy duddy, you know, aw shucks chemistry teacher who discovers that he's got lung cancer and he's afraid for his family and financially they're going to suffer. And he discovers that he uh, could make a lot of money by cooking meth, basically. And, uh, um, and not just a lot of money, but like into the millions of dollars. And he wants to leave all that to his family when he passes away. And so the moral dilemma is, do I keep doing it and keep making more money, you know, because I got to feed my family, you know, but it's a horrible crime and murder ridden world over here in the drug dealer fantasy world. And, uh, um, you know, the, the, and like the more he does it, the more he likes having the power and being the only one who can cook this pure of a product. And like it, mm -hmm. it gives him all this power and it kind of fuels him. And uh, so like that's a great moral dilemma. And uh, just it's it's so it's so relatable, even though I would never cook meth in a million years. But I could see like I could believe that that character is doing it for those reasons and uh it gets out of control obviously or else it wouldn't be a story you know but like yeah. I, I love that and that's what little shop of horrors is to me it's that it's the perfect moral dilemma you know now, did, if you've seen the original one the old black and white right the roger corman movie yeah yeah they said hey i bet you can't write a movie in three days and make a movie in three days and, and that's what came out of it <laughs> yeah um yeah that one's uh good that one's good it's it's campy as hell um, but mm -hmm. so is the musical. So, you know, it's, uh, yeah. yeah, it's silly. It's a, it's a ridiculous story, but it's the perfect, you know, fifties comic book type of, you know, science fiction horror story. So, you know, didn't you get some kind of an honor in the play? I did. Yeah. You know what they, uh, you know, for each, they do like four plays, four or five plays every season at starlight. And for every play each year, they give one ensemble member, um, the ceremonial robe, which is kind of like a Broadway tradition where they give the robe off to in, on Broadway, they give the robe to somebody who, in the ensemble who has the most credits under their belt. Uh, but at Starlight, they do it a little differently. They kind of the directors all kind of get together and kind of vote on who they thought in the ensemble really represents the, you know, their belief system with their with hard work and dedication and all that. And they chose me, which, you know, I, I was flattered and honored because i didn't know they were going to do that and then they said my name and it was like 
me? Why? You know, like, why me? Uh, but they were like, uh, you know, like, it's just, you, you show up, you do the work. And, uh, you know, that's kind of how I've always achieved success in anything I've done. It's just showing up, you know, showing up. And I was taught early in my radio career that you show up and you paint your name on the wall, basically, so they can't forget who you are. And, uh, you know, that's what I bring into everything that I do. And with the with the play, it was just showing up and having fun, you know, so it's like, and I do believe and I, I think I feel like everybody says this, but like everybody in that ensemble could have gotten the robe, you know, um, everybody, everybody sort of, you know, showed up and did the work. I don't think there was anybody who really didn't. So it was a, uh, it was it was an honor basically to be chosen for that and uh you know if they'll have me back again next year i'll audition for something else hey there you go i was yeah. wondering if you were going to do that that would be cool um, yeah, i might be hooked i might, might be hooked now well and speaking of hooked on being on stage that's the other thing you do is stand-up comedy which literally the last time i saw you in person was at your stand-up comedy show right before COVID hit so yes how's that going uh, good. Actually, I'm actually, you know, going to be back at it very soon here. I've got some dates booked uh, at CG's Comedy Club in Bolingbrook in October. And uh, I'm going to be doing, uh, you know, just until then, kind of just getting back on at open mics or wherever I can just to kind of get the rust off, you know, again. And because, you know, I was I did a show right before rehearsal started for Little Shop of Horrors. I did uh, a weekend. And uh, it was great. I mean, it was like uh, right when the, the show, the play start, uh, rehearsal started, I thought I can't, you know, I can't do both right now. So I kind of put off taking more dates until after. And, you know, right as it was ending, I booked some more dates. So now, like, I got to find some stage time, just like shake that rust off a little bit. And I'll be back right where I was before before all this started. And, you know, like this, this is my curse, though, is that I'm interested in too many things. And I end up being okay at the things I get interested in. And so I, I, you know, I get a little bit of success in each thing that I do. And uh, it's hard to decide which one to give my attention to at any given time. So it's like, it's almost like a curse. I, I wish I was good at like three less things. <laughs> put it that way. <laughs> to, to put it, to put it, you know, as a joke, but really it's like, you know, uh, it's tough to, to know which one, because radio is just, it's my job. You know, it was something I was interested in, but I did go into it for a career. I didn't just, it wasn't a hobby, you know, whereas right. stand up that, that and pays the bills. <laughs> right. Right. Stand up and, and writing, you know, that started, they're both started as interest things. I just loved doing, you know, and, uh, you know, I've had, I've had, you know, marginal success in, in, in stand up, and I've had a couple of things published in writing and, you know, it's been great. You know, I, I can say that I got to do a lot of things, that uh, most people don't get to do, you know, uh, and that's just because I put myself out there and accept the rejections, accept, you know, more, more sheets to put on the nail on my wall, you know, <laughs> like, uh, in that, that's, think, that's what you have to do. To me that's something you get better at as you get older. Cause I know when I was a kid, anytime I tried something and I didn't do well at it right at the beginning, it's like, okay, I'm not doing that anymore. And I just put it aside and I'd never touch it again. Um, so I think that getting used to dealing with the rejection and understanding that you're not going to be great at everything right off the bat. Right. You have to keep trying. I think that's something you get with as you get older and get some more maturity. Right. It's understanding what a rejection actually is. You know, it's it's less about you being terrible and more about not exactly what they need at that time. You know, so it, it's it's never so much this is not good. This is bad work or you did a bad job at the audition. It's just, we have other things we're going to use instead, you know? And, um, when you go out to do open mics for a stand up comedy, that's when you're trying out new jokes, new material that you haven't put out before. And, um, sometimes they're just not going to land. You could think they're funny, the funniest thing in the world. And sometimes they just aren't going to work. And, uh, that's another form of rejection you get in comedy is that you could be rejected by the audience point blank, you know, in, in the moment. Too. Yeah. <laughs> and and you, you could have a joke that works for six months and then all of a sudden nobody's laughing at it. It's just a weird animal. And that's, that's another form of the rejection that you can, you can, but you have to learn to take your rejections and learn from them, whether, you know, in, in writing, you know, in writing, you don't, you don't always know why you were rejected. 
you know, like we were talking about earlier, you know, when you get a note that tells you, hey, this is good, but we didn't like how this happened or, you know, we thought this was a little bit weak or whatever. That's great because that's something you can actually use and be like, all right, so if I fix that in the story, maybe it'll get some attention or whatever, you know, yeah. or you could disagree with the the editor and say, you know what, I, maybe it's not for him. Maybe I'll try it somewhere else. But at least you got a little bit of feedback and you can know why, but you don't always know why, you know, all you can do is put in the work to get better no matter what level you're at right and that's kind of it with everything you do though if you think about it mm -hmm. you know just keep trying to get better yeah it, that that's that can go for you know your 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 hobbies your vocation or even your your social life or your marriage or your your you know your family life you can always get better you're never the best you're going to be and you're never better than everybody else and you just have to keep working to be the best you can be well and i was gonna say one thing a lot of people tend to get into is they like to compare themselves to everyone else to somebody else that's really successful at you should never do that what you want to do it's still a competition but make it a competition with who you used to be right who you were right. last time you know it's like your work ought to always be the best work you've ever done until the next one comes along you know, it's funny. We you know, the the Olympics just wrapped up, and uh, uh, they they were talking a lot about Simone Biles. Uh, I mean, I know she was having some some mental health issues and and had to drop out of a few events. But every time they talk about Simone Biles, they talk about how she never competes with other people. She's always competing to beat herself. She's always trying to be better than she was last time, and I think that's the secret. You know, is is try to top yourself and be good enough for you. And, uh, you know, what, what, how you perceive that is up to you and you're always responsible for, for how you view that. But, um, to be able to say, I'm not competing against my opponents, I'm trying to do what's good for me. And that, that, I think that's the, the secret and that's how she got as good as she is in the same way with, you know, Michael Jordan, you know, it was always, oh, yeah. you know, be be better. But, you know, Michael Jordan had a, a different kind of uh, competitive streak, as we all learned, uh, you know, uh, but he, he was a special case, though, uh, you know, always trying to be better. And, and if you tell him he's not good enough, then he will turn around and say, well, I, I will show you that I am, you know, and I think that's, <laughs> yeah. that's, and, yeah, and that's, a, that's another way you can do things, you know, but you're always trying to get better. And I think that's like admitting that you can get better is, is the secret. I mean, this this might be opening Pandora's box. But you brought up sports, <laughs> and you sure. and I both also share love of the Chicago Bears. So, yes. what do you think? What do, what do you think of what you've seen so far? Uh, well, I, I don't know. I don't know if they're going to start the right guy on opening day at quarterback. I, I think we have a uh, gem and Justin Fields. And, uh, you know, I think that there's a, a lot he's going to be able to do. And I don't know if uh, using, I mean, they, they're going to start Andy Dalton. Uh, and I, I'm not sure that's the right choice, um, but I know they're paying for him and they probably just, you know, they're paying for, I think they got him for a year or something, you know, <laughs> like, they're paying for him. So you, yeah, so they, they don't want to sit another quarterback that they're paying for, basically. And, uh, you know, I don't know enough about sports or sports management or anything like that to really say why they're doing it. Uh, because from what I can see, Justin Fields is young, he's hungry, and, uh, you know, and, and so is Patrick Mahomes. And I think Mahomes sat his first year, uh, at, at least played second string his first year. So, I mean, hope, hopefully we've got a guy who's uh, ready to come out slinging like Mahomes did. Yeah, personally, I, get, I think my take on it is, from watching Dalton play, I think Trubisky was a, a better quarterback than Dalton. And if they were going to go that route, they should have kept Trubisky. But on the other hand, um, I think Fields is a little rough still. He needs to learn. I think well, maybe bringing Dalton out there and then maybe giving Fields some reps in the first couple games until eventually just – putting him in as the starter might be the better way to go. I don't know. Or until Dalton completely blows it. And, <laughs> yeah. uh, Which might be early. Know, I don't know. <laughs> that first six interception game, you watch. Fields will be on. Fields will be starting the next one. 
You know, oh, yeah. uh, we're we're <laughs> notorious know, for punishing our quarterbacks in Chicago. You know, when they when oh, they yeah. have and I don't, I don't know if the offensive line's going to be able to protect any of them either. It doesn't look didn't look, look very good. Gary, I've been alive since 1982, and I cannot remember. You know, I, mean, I know there was the '85 Bears, which okay, we'll we'll say I can't remember a time where I was old enough to understand football that the Bears had an offensive line that could protect their quarterback. I, I don't think it, it's ever happened. Uh, you, yep. Even the year we went to the Super Bowl, uh, that was about the defense. It had, no, it had nothing to do with the O line, for sure. There's we haven't had a good O line in my recent memory. Last year, they were showing some signs of being, being able to protect the quarterback a little bit. It was an improvement from the years before, but still not that great. It takes more than signs to go to the Super Bowl. <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. It really does. Yeah. That's for sure. So is there anything else you'd like to chat about? I mean, you know, I, I guess I could just say to anybody who's uh, watching or listening that you should definitely uh, – pick up the book, pick up Spooky Houses or Spooky Berwin or any of the, the great books that you have available and, uh, you know, read once in a while. <laughs> read. Yeah. Uh, it's, hand a book over to your kids and say, hey, read this, you know. Uh, and uh, I think literacy is uh, important. And I think it's, uh, it's, I think it's dangerously close to becoming a lost, uh, a lost commodity. And I think um, that everyone should encourage everyone else to read. And that's what I do. So, Reading is fundamental. There we go. We got our public say public uh, a little PSA public service announcement. In. <laughs> yeah, not not only that, but you know, it, it sharpens your it sharpens your mind. You know, it's uh, it's important, so you should do it. I agree with you completely. And uh, once more, let's see. I'm terrible with this stupid lining up on how this works. But that's good houses, and you can get it uh, at lulucom spotlight slash uh, strange sound and Great. thanks again Kevin and I look forward to putting some more of your stuff in some more books and uh, I look forward when we can get together and meet up in person again um, it's been too long <laughs> absolutely so, yeah and I you know I appreciate you uh, having me on and uh, chat with me today yeah. thanks Gary absolutely. it was fun buddy take care see you next time spooky ventures is the home for spooky content and spooky merchandise on the web Check it out today at SpookyVentures.com. And remember, always keep it spooky.